So thank you for the invitation. Thanks to Professor Naumov and Professor Bobkov and everybody coming here. It's a pleasure to be here, first time in Moscow, first time in Russia. So this talk is about uh, optimal matching. So what is optimal matching? So this is a combinatorial problem, trying to find the minimal cost, transportation cost between two samples of points. So typically you have two samples, X and Y, and uh, you want to match a coordinate of X with a coordinate of Y in the best way in order to minimize some, the sum of some cost function C between Xi and another coordinate of, uh, of Y. So this is a, a combinatorial problem. And uh, for the study here presented in this talk, the cost function will be simply the Euclidean length to the P between X and Y. And uh, for simplicity, for the further developments, let us normalize by 1 over N the sum of the cost that will be easier for the further purposes. So we will study this uh, optimal matching problem from a probabilistic point of view. Namely, the points will be random. And uh, typically, we choose them to be IID, independent and identically distributed, uh, with values in, in RD. And uh, we are interested into this optimal matching problem, trying to minimize the preceding uh, quantity uh, on the average. right? So it's a kind of first order study. What is the order of growth in N? n, which is the size of the samples, of this expected optimal matching uh, quantity. It's the minimum over all permutations sigma of the sum of this, of this matching. So nothing more than this. And uh, as we will see, this problem depends on a number of parameters, and uh, in particular, it depends in a rather sensitive way upon the dimension, the underlying dimension of the state space. It, of course, depends on P, which is the power of the Euclidean length in the definition of the cost function. So the cost function is simply x minus y in Euclidean norm to the P. And for the purpose of this talk, we will mainly concentrate on the values P is equal to 1 and P is equal to 2. And of course, this also depends on the common distribution from a probabilistic run, uh, point of view, on the distribution, the common distribution of the, of the samples, of the sample random variables, xi and yi. So these are the three parameters that we will try to follow in the study of this uh, expected optimal matching problem. And uh, there is a kind of uh, main example uh, in this investigation, which is simply the case uh, when you take uh, the points to be uniform on the unit cube. So you take the uniform for the xi and yi's, they are iid, you take them uniform over the unit cube of uh, dimension d. And in this case, the intuition is that when you have uh, Uniform, n uniform points uh, in, the unit cube, in the unit cube, the intuition is that the typical distance between those two points is of the order of 1 over n to the 1 over d, where d is the dimension, so that you expect that the quantity we are looking at should be of the order of 1 over n to the 1 over d, raised to the p, because the cost, uh, there is a, a, a piece power in the definition of the cost, uh, you expect that this is the correct order for the uniform distribution uh, of this expected cost. The point is that this is only true in high dimension. And this is not the case in dimension one. 
and it is not the case in dimension two. Dimension one is actually rather easy because you have explicit uh, rearrangement inequalities on the real line, and you see that the expected cost is actually the square root of what is expected, right? Before we said one over n to the p over d, so when d is equal to one, you expect uh, one over n to the p, but it's only the square root. So it's much, uh, much uh, bigger, actually. And uh, everything is explicit in the one-dimensional case. And for example, so by the way, this is just a, a short explanation of the sign, the equivalent sign, which is used uh, throughout this, code, this talk, meaning that the two quantities are in between, uh, uh, within a constant C that depends maybe on other things, but certainly not on N, the size of the samples. And uh, so in dimension one, everything is, is really explicit. And for example, you can compute exactly the expected optimal case, uh, optimal cost when uh, P is equal to two, and you get this, this one over one over three over n plus one, which is explicit. The critical case in this investigation is the case D is equal to two. And there is a famous theorem due to Ashtai, Kumlosh, and Tushnadi in the, in the mid eighties, saying that there is an extra logarithmic factor uh, with respect to the expected uh, value of this, of this cost. So this is a, a, a rather delicate uh, statement. It was established by these authors in 84 using some uh, combinatorics on dyadic uh, partition. So I put Hungarian in parentheses, simply meaning that I don't understand anything about this. And since then, there have been other proofs uh, of, this, uh, of this result, in particular by Let Leighton and Shore as well as, as Talagran, using some ideas from the generic chaining idea or the study of uh, stochastic processors, majorizing measures, and so on. And uh, together with, with Sergei Bobkov, we recently uh, came up with, a, at least in the case P is equal to one, with a rather simple proof based on Fourier analysis that I will try to present uh, later on. So this is, actually is a critical case in uh, dimension two. So this is the optimal, pro optimal matching problem we are interested in. And uh, to start with, we will actually recast this problem in terms of uh, Kantorovich metrics. And this is done in the easy and, and classical way by the following uh, identities. Namely, if you have the two samples, x, x1, xn and y1, yn, you consider the associated empirical measures, mu n and nu n. And then there is an identity between the optimal <coughs> cost that we were defining before, this minimum over all permutations, and the Kantorovich metric to the p, the wp to the, to the p, raised to the power p, between the two empirical measures and wp WP is this uh, monch kantorovich metric, which is this infimum of the integral of the cost over all couplings with respective marginals, uh, mu and nu, uh, first marginal nu, first mar second marginal nu. And the identity in the middle of the, of the slide is simply coming from, from the fact that if you write the kantorovich metric for those two empirical measures, you are actually, the couplings are uh, a family of bistochastic matrices, and there is a classical theorem by Birkhoff saying that the extreme points of the set of bistochastic matrix matrices are precisely the uh, permutation matrices giving rise to this identity. So using this uh, uh, identity between the optimal cost and the WP, we now just recast the problem trying to investigate what is the rate of this expectation in this Kantorovich metric. And uh, once you have this formulation, you can also look at a more a statistical version of this problem. Namely, if you consider that 
uh, your sample x1 to xn is iid with the same distribution mu, you may be interested into the rate of convergence of the empirical measure mu n to the common distribution mu in this Kantorovic metric, right? And uh, it's very simple to compare the so-called bipartite matching when you have two samples and two empirical measures and the case of, which is more of statistical interest between one sample and the limiting target measure. It, this is very easy to, to compare, so-called bipartite, bipartite and monopartite, namely that you may first use the triangle inequality on the Kantorovich metric WP to see that if you control the Kantorovich metric from the empirical measure to the target measure, then you, compare, you, com, you control the, the bipartite case. And uh, conversely, you simply use the n-sense inequality and you, you, you have the, the other inequality on the average. So the problem of the bipartite, so coupling of two samples or just a rate of convergence of the empirical measure towards the, the target measure are equivalent problems. And this is what we will study. So we'll make a first order study, study of this expected value of WP to the p uh, mu n towards mu. And uh, as we discussed this before, this problem depends on three parameters, the underlying dimension where the random points take their values, depends on p, the parameter of, so the Kantorovich metric parameter, the parameter of the cost function, and it will depend on the common distribution mu, okay? And this is what we would like to uh, investigate uh, during this, this lecture. So, as we mentioned, this problem is rather sensitive to the dimension. And to start with, let us just simply start in dimension one. What happens in dimension one? So, maybe the, the project is, as we will see, a comparison with the known uniform example that we presented before. So, what happens in dimension one? So dimension one is rather specific because you may use a number of explicit representations for uh, Kantorovich metrics. And uh, the first one is a very classical one. If you consider W1, the first one in the family, you have a very simple integral representation of this metric in terms of the distribution function functions of the two probability motions. Just this integral of, the, abs of the, the absolute value of the difference between the two uh, distribution functions. For WP, it's a little bit, uh, you have to shift a little bit the, the thing and to rather work with uh, the inverse distribution functions, so-called quantile representations. And uh, if you apply this formula for mu and nu given by empirical measures, you see that very rapidly you enter uh, the question of uh, rearrangement of the samples that you are looking at. This we will see in a minute. So let us just concentrate on W1, use this formula, and study the problem that we are looking at, namely what is the rate in W1, the expected rate in W1 of the empirical measure mu n towards the limiting, uh, the limiting target measure. So if you read this inequality and you integrate, it's not very difficult to see that actually this uh, expected rate is of the order of one over root n, just use kind of rate of convergence in the central limit theorem to get this one over root n. And you see that one over root n is the rate, the standard rate for the uniform distribution. And you see that this rate actually holds for a large family of distributions. This condition is a little bit, uh, I mean, you, you need to interpret it. For example, if you have a second, just a little bit better than a second moment, two plus epsilon moment, this condition is satisfied, and you have the rate one over root n, like for the uniform. So this is pretty, a pretty general statement. In one dimension, you have the one over root n rate, if, on, if, and, only if, if and only if you have a rather mild moment condition on the underlying distribution. 
So that's for W1, not so, not so difficult. So let us shift to WP for P bigger than 1, in which case, as we said, we will be using this uh, quantile representation of uh, WP, which we may reimpret in terms of order statistics. So this is simply the so-called uh, rearrangement inequality that tells you that WP between, say, two empirical uh, samples, mu n and mu n, is given by 1 of n, the sum of this difference between the rearrangement of the two samples. So once you have this inequality, you just integrate it, and it's easy to find uh, an equivalent between uh, those two quantities. And uh, let us test this... Uh, this equivalence on the known uniform example, then this is easy because if mu is uniform, if the samples, if the random variables of the samples are IID with the same uniform distribution, it's classical that the highest terms in the rearrangement of your sample satisfies, is, is, has a, a beta distribution with those parameters. So everything is explicit. And uh, you compute, and you see that the rate is what was announced before, namely 1 over square root of n to the power p, because we are dealing with wp. You can even do explicit formulas when p is equal to 2. This is what I mentioned before. When p is equal to 2, you have this exact, those exact rates for the monopartite and the bipartite case. And uh, you can even go further, and there are some fluctuations result, namely that if you take W2, you multiply by N, you get convergence towards some, uh, some chi-square, uh, integral of the square of the Brownian bridge. So the picture is, is rather complete for, uh, for W2 for the uniform. And now, as before, we have the uniform example in mind for comparison with other distributions. And well, now the question is, is this rate also true for other distributions? And uh, what happens is that the standard rates W2 in W2 is 1 over n, as for the uniform, if and only if you have now this condition on both the distribution function f and its density or at least the density of the absolutely continuous part of the distribution function. So let us just compare this statement with what we had with W1. So for W1, we had only an equivalence with the distribution function. Here, we need a little bit more because we need something uh, involving both the distribution function and the density, right? So this is obtained by ideas related to the uniform case. We, re we reduce to the uniform case, and then we use a kind of Poincaré type inequality for, uh, bet for beta distributions. The condition uh, which is here may be rewritten by a change of, of variable in terms of this function i, which is the composition between the density and the inverse distribution function. So some, sometimes this is called an isoparametric function of the, of, the, of the model, of the distribution function. And uh, now what happens is that for some distribution, this integral may be infinite. So you don't know exactly what happens. But for a subfamily, namely the so-called block concave distributions on the real line, we can say a little bit more. So what is a log concave distribution? It is simply a distribution with a density of the type e to the minus v, where v is convex. And in this case, we can say actually a little bit more, namely that the expected w2 between mu n and mu is actually equivalent to this quantity which is basically the same as before, but you cut the integral uh, in between basically 1 minus 1 over n and 1 over n. Right? So you take into account the, to take into account the singularities 
of the of this i function, which is in the, the definition of the integral. I just briefly flash the dis the, the proof of this of this uh, of this equivalence. So it's going back to the order statistics representation we described before, and uh, the fact that uh, in general you know that the ice term uh, in this uh, rearrangement, the xi star, the ice random variable in the rearrangement of your sample, has a distribution which is given by this formula, has a distribution with a density which is given by this formula, so which is just actually an extension of the uniform case. And uh, it turns out that this density is again log-concave. And for log concave distribution in dimension one, there are very accurate computations that you may develop. And in particular, you can see that the variance can be computed in terms of the density. And after some a bit tedious computation, you have the equivalence with this I function leading to this uh, equivalence. Now, as we said, the integral that characterizes the standard rate one of n may or may not be satisfied. Here's an example. Take mu to be the standard normal distribution on the real line. The function i, in this case, has a known behavior, which is t square root of log of 1 over t, up to numerical factors, as t goes to 0. And if you plug the behavior of this i function into the uh, this equivalence that we have n by n, you get that the rate is not the standard rate 1 over n, it is log log of n divided by n. Okay. Another example, if you take the exponential, the i function is of the order of t, and the rate is log n over n. And actually you can develop this in full generality, and even for any p, as was done in a joint work with Sergei Bobkov. For the further purposes, let us summarize what we know for the standard normal distribution on the real line. If mu is a uniform distribution on the unit interval, we know that the rate is 1 over square root of n to the p, 1 over n to the p over 2. In the Gaussian case, what happens? If p is between 1 and 2, p is strictly less than 2, it is as the uniform. When you reach p is equal to 2, there is a phase transition, as they say in physics. It's no more 1 over n, it's log log n divided by n. And then if p becomes bigger and bigger, you see that the difference is more and more important. Because in the uniform, it's really decaying very, very fast, and for the Gaussian case, you have only have a correction to 1 over n. So the lesson here is that the W2 Pantorovic metric, when p is bigger than 2, are much, much more sensitive to the distribution than W1. Because for W1, or actually WP for p less than 2, they behave like the uniform. Okay? So let me briefly mention that there is, recently it was shown that there is a, a limit, an exact limit in this uh, Gaussian case, and there is a fluctuation result as we had before for the uniform case. Just you have to correct by the log log n term in order to get the same type of, of result. So this was for dim dimension one. It would be natural to do dimension two next, but uh, for pedagogical reason, let us jump to dimension three. Dimension three is actually easier. You have more space, so the matching is easier to develop. These are the results that we know for the uniform in dimension one. The Ashtai kumlosh Tusnadi result in dimension two. And in dimension three, there, are, there is less surprise because the rate is exactly given by the intuitive uh, distance be between uniform points in the unit tube. 
So it is exactly of the order of the uniform spacings. And this actually develops in more generality because at, as soon as you have a, a distribution mu, no more uniform, assuming just that it has enough <coughs> moments, you get again the same rate, at least when p is not too big. And this is developed using kind of mimicking the AKT theorem using dyadic partitions. I just would like to mention for the further purposes that this general method that, that is mentioned here, this dyadic partitions, which were, have been used already by Ashtai, Komlosh, and Tuzladi, if you try to apply them in generality in dimension two, you never get anything better than one over root n. So this means that you never catch uh, what is good enough for, for the theorem. Dimension three is easier, and it's so easy, well, in quotes, of course, that you can even find limits, although the exact values of the limits are not known, because they are based on subadditivity arguments. And here are a few examples of limits which are known when p is equal to 1 and when p is equal to 2 using a kind of uh, modified uh, subadditivity arguments. So, really, the critical case in this optimal matching problem is the case uh, d is equal to 2. And uh, as we said, there have been a number of tools and arguments which have been used in order to establish this uh, AKT theorem in dimension 2. The first proof was combinatorics on dyadic partitions, and then some generic chaining ideas from the study of stochastic processes, majorizing measures, and so on. And uh, what I would like to do now is to present a, a recent a simple proof based on the Fourier analysis that we obtained together with Sergei Bobkov, at least when p is equal to 1 for w1. Okay? So the first step in order to uh, present this uh, simple Fourier analytic proof of the AKT theorem when p is equal to 1 is to actually uh, look at probability measures not on the unit square. I, I do it in, in dimension d, so not on the unit cube, but on the torus. Okay, So you, you look at minus pi plus pi identification at pi with the metric of the torus. And uh, you consider the associated kantorovich rubinstein representation of W1 as a supremum over all Lipschitz function of the difference of those two integrals, integral of u with respect to mu minus the integral of u with respect to nu, where u is on, defined on the torus and Lipschitz with respect to the metric of the of the torus, right? So it's actually not difficult to see that uh, this W1 is the same as uh, if you take the soup over all Lipschitz function, which are 2 pi period periodic, because this is on, on the torus. And uh, it is also not difficult to see that if you are dealing with probability measures which are supported on a smaller part of the of the, my, of the cube minus pi plus pi to the d, for example, 0 pi, then the, the Euclidean metric and the metric of the torus are the same, so that the w1 in this case is the same as the w1 if you have probability measures on the unit cube, 0, 1, or 0 pi to the d. So this is just a bit technical reduction to the fact that uh, we look for probability measures on the torus rather than on the cube. It doesn't make any difference. But of course, it is the first step in order to develop uh, Fourier analytic arguments. Now, once you are on the torus, once you have two pi periodic functions, you, of course, uh, consider Fourier analysis. And uh, let us introduce the Fourier-Stilgeous coefficients, 
Actually, I don't know why uh, Sergei is insisting, in, insisting to put Stilges into this uh, definition. But I'm happy about this because Stilges uh, is a mathematician who was part of the Toulouse University at the end of the 19th century. And uh, actually, he, he died at the age of 40 due to some health problem. And he's buried in the main cemetery of, of Toulouse. And uh, during the time uh, in Toulouse, he founded a, a journal, which is uh, the annal of the Toulouse uh, University, and a journal in which you are invited to submit papers, of course. This was the, the message. So Fourier Stilgers coefficient. Now, once you have a, a two pi periodic function, which is nice, smooth enough, you may develop it into a, a Fourier series. And if you look at the difference of the two integrals that you have in the definition of the Kantorovich representation of W1, you look at the integral of u d mu minus the integral of u d nu, and you expand everything along the Fourier series together with the Fourier Stilgers coefficients that we uh, defined before. Okay? So that's easy. Now, what is the assumption? U is 2 pi periodic and Lipschitz. Okay? So a little bit of uh, L2 analysis. You take the derivative of your function U, of your Fourier series, you take the gradient, you take the gradient square, you integrate it, and you get the series of m square modulus of a m square. So the modulus of a m square is just a complex modulus of a m, which is a complex number. And the other modulus is a, is a kind of a clean length of a vector m. m is a vector of integers m1 to md. And you take the sum of the squares of the coordinates of your uh, integer vector. OK? So a very easy Parseval in uh, identity. The integral of the grad u square is equal to this sum of m square a m squared. But u is Lipschitz. So the gradient of u is almost everywhere bound. It's one Lipschitz. The gradient of u is almost everywhere less than or equal to 1. So the, uh, the left-hand side of this uh, identity is less than or equal to 1. So you use Cauchy-Schwarz on the previous. You have the sum of a m, the difference of the Fourier coefficients, together with the fact that the sum of m square a m square is less than one. You use Cauchy-Schwarz and you get this. So that's pretty easy to obtain. The point of this inequality is that the series on the right hand side may be infinite, and the inequality useless. In order to make it useful. What you do is a smoothing argument. Smoothing argument, here we are using the heat kernel, the standard heat kernel on the torus, but you, can, you could use other uh, smoothing argument. And uh, if you use the, this heat kernel, you take a probability measure mu, you take the convolution with the heat kernel, and what happens is that the m's Fourier coefficient of the smoothed a probability mu t is just the same as the Fourier coefficient of uh, the m's Fourier coefficients of mu multiplied by this exponential <coughs> minus m square times t. Okay. Just basic uh, Fourier analysis on this uh, smooth, on this convolution by a Gaussian kernel. Now, you have mu, you smooth it out as mu t. What is the price that you pay when you replace mu by mu t in w1? Very easy exercise. The price is at most of the order of square root of t. Now, simple use of the triangle inequality. You start with two probability measures, mu and nu. You smooth them out, replace by mu t, nu t. The price you pay for the smoothing is uh, square root of t. And then you apply the preceding inequality in terms of the series. And what you get is the following. With this extra uh, exponential minus 2m squared times t, which is the benefit of the smoothening by the heat kernel. Okay? 
So this is the basic inequality, this Fourier analysis uh, uh, inequality that we are using. Now we will use this inequality for mu and new empirical measures. Okay. In the AKT theorem, mu and nu are replaced by the empirical measures mu n and nu n of two uh, samples which are uniformly distributed on the unit uh, on the unit cube. Actually, it turns out that we can do a little bit more general, so let us do it. We, sh we still assume that we have two samples, x1 to xn and 1y one, one to 1n. We assume that they have the same distribution, for example, uniform, but it could be any distribution on the unit cube, any distribution. And uh, we don't need that they are independent. We only need that the couples, x1, y1, and so on, xn, yn, are pairwise independent. So that's a bit more general than the AKT theorem. So we apply the preceding inequality. We take expectation. A little bit of Jensen's inequality allows you to put the expectation inside uh, the square root. And what you have to compute is the expected value of this difference, f mu n minus f mu n. But now, what is this Fourier coefficient, f mu n? This is simply, since mu n is an empirical measure, this is simply a sum. It's 1 over n, the sum of the uh, complex exponentials of your, of your samples. Definition of the... Fourier transform of an empirical measure. If you take this expectation, you simply have by uh, orthogonality, rather pairwise independent, independence, that this is of the order of 1 over n. Just take the expectation of a sum of complex exponentials, which are centered or by symmetry. Uh, this is of the order of 1 over n. So this is what we get. There is a 1 over square root of n, which is in front. And uh, the last step is simply to optimize in T this inequality. We have the parameter n, which is the rate we are looking at. And there is this parameter T, which is allowing to vary in order to get the best result. The optimization uh, will take place when T is small enough. And uh, not very difficult to see by comparing series and <coughs> integrals that uh, the series uh, which is under the square root is equivalent to this integral using uh, comparison with series and integral and uh, polar coordinates. And uh, when d is equal to 1, the order of growth of this quantity when t is small, actually any t when d is equal to 1, is order 1. When d is equal to 2, it is log of 1 over, one over t, simply because you see uh, what happens when uh, d is equal to, to 2. You have this r to the d minus 3 becomes a 1 over r. So you can feel that there is a logarithmic factor. And when d is bigger than 3, you get this power type function. And if you do this, you exactly get the AKT theorem. When d is equal to 1, you have the rate 1 over n. When d is equal to 2, you get the critical rate, square root of log n over n, due to the fact that the s function is a log. And uh, when d is bigger than 3, you get the standard rate. With a little bit more effort, you can show that this is actually of the same order, and there is no loss in this, in this proof. So this was for the simple Fourier analytic proof of the AKT theorem. Let me mention that maybe this proof has some potential usefulness in the study of similar problems when you replace the empirical measures on samples of IID random variables by spectral measures of random matrices. Why not? So you take the eigenvalues of a random matrix, you look at the empirical measure on these eigenvalues, and you try to follow the same approach, trying to catch a rate of convergence uh, in the Kantorovic metric of the spectral measure towards the limiting spectral measure. So typically, the semicircle law 
in Wigner theorem about uh, Gaussian uh, random matrices. Uh, of course, at a technical level, you, you would need to estimate this difference of the uh, characteristic functions of the Fourier twin Tilge's coefficients in order to, uh, to get something. So maybe it's a good time to have a short break before going to some more technical. So short break. So the second part will be almost exclusively devoted to dimension two. So we start again with the AKT, hashtag Komlosch to Schnadi theorem. Here uh, in the Kantorovich description, so mu is uniform on the unit square. Mu n is the associated empirical measure of a sample of IID random variable uniform on the unit square. And uh, the expected W2 squared is of the order of log n over n. Uh, a major breakthrough in this uh, in the study of the theorem was achieved uh, just recently by uh, Ambrosio Stra Trevisan. So the paper first appeared in 2016, but was only published in 19, where they are able to show the exact limit for this W2. Exact limit is 1 over pi square. And in the bipartite case, there is a factor 2. So one over two pi. So they can even do more and work not only on the unit square, but on more general Riemannian uh, measures, two-dimensional uh, Riemannian volume element on a compact Riemannian manifold. And the limit is always the same. So for example, on the sphere, S2, on the torus, T2, it's always the same limit, 1 over 4 pi. Just as, as references, uh, let me mention that the case of the two sphere and the torus, not the limit, but the order of growth, uh, has been also studied by Holden, Teresh, and Zai. And then the exact limit in the bipartite case was just recently obtained by Ambrosio and Glaudio. So this work of Ambrosio Stra and Trevisan was uh, motivated by some uh, conjectures and uh, simulations by uh, physicists. And uh, they had a, those physicists, they had a, a PDE ansatz, ansatz, a PDE intuition in order to investigate this problem, uh, which is the following. If you look at the so-called Brunier map, between uh, two probability densities, rho zero and rho one. Uh, if, you if you write the change of formula in order to push uh, the measure rho zero to rho one, you get this Mont-Jean-Pair equation, which is written here. And uh, the intuition, the, the physicist uh, intuition or ansatz is that if the two probability densities are getting close to one, then this Mont-Jean-Pair equation is transformed into a Poisson type equation, which is of this type. And uh, in this limit, in this linearization of the Mont-Jean-Pair equation, it happens that the W2 Kantorovich metric is replaced by a Sobolev type norm. And this is what we would like to use in this, uh, in this study. Actually, if I understand correctly, all this will be presented next week during the lectures by uh, Dario Trevisan during the workshop. So I will not enter too much into those details. Nevertheless, I would like to concentrate on some of these ideas, at least in order to achieve the upper bound in this uh, AKT theorem. So here we are on the manifold M, two-dimensional. Rho is a Riemannian metric. And uh, we study in the same way the expected value of W2 squared and try to show that at least it is of the order of log N over M. This we already know more or less on the unit uh, square. But we try to do it 
in an abstract setting, in an abstract Riemannian setting. And uh, these are the ideas, these PDE transportation ideas used by Ambrosio, Stra, and Trevisan in order to achieve the exact limit. And the ideas are based on two main steps that I would like to briefly present. The first step is a smoothing, so-called regularization step. And the second step is what I just tried to briefly uh, emphasize, this linearization of the mont jean equation in terms of the Poisson equation that is a kind of energy estimate. And in order to develop this idea, these ideas, we actually start on a manifold, on a compact manifold of dimension D, and we will see later on why the dimension D is critical. And uh, it is also of interest to develop this approach in the non-compact setting, namely on manifolds where you have a weighted probability measure with infinite support. So this might be a little bit complicated, but think, for example, simply of RD with a Gaussian measure. So RD, you have the Lebesgue measure, and you put the Gaussian weight, and you get the Gaussian measure. So that's a weighted manifold. It's a weighted space, and it is non-compact. So it's different than the compact case uh, for the unit uh, cube or things like this. So these are the ideas that we would like to describe. And uh, as announced, the first step is the smoothening, which is just uh, an abstract formulation of the smoothening that we described before by in this Fourier analytic proof of the AKT theorem. So you look at the heat kernel on your manifold. You can do it in any dimension. Call it PTXY. And what you do is that you replace the Dirac masses delta xi, which appear in the definition of the empirical measure, by a smooth version, namely pt of at the point xi as a density with respect to the Riemannian measure mu. So you, you have a, a Dirac measure, which is a discrete measure, and you smooth it out by the heat kernel to get now a probability density with respect to the Riemannian measure. So you have densities here. You have densities here, so everything is, is smoothed out. And uh, as before, the question is, what is the price you pay when you replace a Dirac measure by this smoothed heat kernel measure? And this is not so difficult to see because W2 has nice convexity properties. And what happens is that the price you pay when you replace mu n by the empirical measure, which is now smoothed out, the price you pay, you pay is a so-called dispersion contribution, which is simply the integral of the Riemannian metric squared, rho xy squared, times this heat kernel. And we will see what is the behavior of this, the typical behavior of this quantity as t varies. So the discrete empirical measure is replaced by uh, measure with a density. And these densities, they are of this type, 1 over n, the sum of pt xi, which is random, and y is uh, the, the variable of the density. So these are random densities, right? The density is f of y. y is the density with respect to the Riemannian measure mu. And they are random due to the xi's, which are uh, given by the sample of uh, IID random variables with distribution mu. So f is a random density. Now pt is a, is a heat kernel. The integral of pt is 1. By the law of large numbers, f, the density, is close to 1. Okay? And this is exactly the intuition that we had before from the physicist about the fact that we have a, a density which is getting close to 1. And we would, we would like to quantify how close this density is to y in terms of the W2 metric. So this is the law of large numbers, but actually you, have, you can go one step further and uh, say that, OK, you have law of large numbers. f is close to 1, but f is also close to 1 plus uh, some Gaussian error term of the order of 1 over root n 
times G, which is a Gaussian contribution, which you may interpret as a Gaussian free field. Let me not enter into this. So the heuristic is now that you are dealing with a probability density, which is random, but very close to one. Okay? And you want to quantify this. And uh, in order to quantify this, you may refer to a classical result in the study of the Kantorovich metric W2, which is the following. You take a reference measure mu. So typically, this will be a Riemannian measure in, in our setting on, on your compact manifold. So normalized to be a probability measure. And you look at another measure with density f with respect to mu, and f is very close to 1. f is of the order of 1 plus epsilon something. And you go to the limit as epsilon goes to 0. So, of course, w2 goes to 0, but you want to quantify the speed of convergence, and it is of the order of epsilon square, and what you get is this quantity, which you may interpret as a negative Sobolev norm dual Sobolev norm. So this is a classical infinitesimal behavior. You may quantify this behavior as an inequality, actually, which is not as sharp as the infinitesimal because there is a factor 4, but you can always control the W2 metric by this dual Sobolev norm, which is uh, written here, up to the factor 4. So you have to take f minus 1 because uh, f is getting close to 1, and uh, you take the h minus 1 norm of f minus 1. So let me just go briefly over the proof of this inequality. The proof uh, relies on the Kantorovich duality description of the monge kantorovich distance W2 in terms of those uh, q functions which are infimum convolutions. And uh, these infimum convolutions, they form a, a semigroup which satisfies the so-called Hamilton-Jacobi uh, equation. And uh, if I just flash the argument, you, you start from this uh, W2 representation. So you start from this difference between Q phi and phi, and uh, you just do a parametrization uh, between these two quantities and uh, after some tricks, uh, you get the result. So, so let me maybe skip this technical uh, step in order to go to the inequality on which we will base uh, the analysis, namely the control of the uh, Kantorovich metric W2 by this dual Sobolev norm, this Sobolev norm of index minus 1. Now, let us have a look at this uh, dual Sobolev norm. If g is a mean zero function, this is the definition of the Sobolev norm. One step is integration by parts. That's easy. You replace uh, the grad square by uh, integration by part by g times the inverse of delta. So delta is the Laplace Beltrami operator on your manifold. And uh, there is a classical trace formula, namely that the inverse of your Laplace Beltrami operator or negative Laplace Beltrami operator, you may rewrite it formally as the integral of the semigroup with kernel, the heat kernel that we described before. And as such, the Sobolev norm takes the form of this integral along the semigroup. Okay? Semigroup is given by the convolution with the heat kernel that we had before. So with this uh, in the hand, we rewrite the inequality in terms of the, of the semigroup, and we can compare the W2 between the two distances, the two probability measures mu and nu, in terms of this integral along uh, the semigroup. Now, in what we are studying, the, one of the measures, the, the measure nu, is this empirical measure, which is smoothed out by the heat kernel. So we plug this uh, smoothed empirical measure into the preceding inequality, and we integrate. 
So if we integrate, at some point, we have to integrate this semigroup of G, which is the density we are looking at. And here is a place where the, what we described before as the heuristic based on the strong low of large numbers and the central limit theorem. Central limit theorem here is simply uh, reduced to the fact that we are taking a variance, a variance of this expression, and the variance of this expression reduces to the heat kernel of, uh, uh, of the smoothening of what we are doing. And uh, the inequality that we get is the following. And uh, if we summarize those two steps, we have first the step which is the disturb dispersion contribution, which is the effect of the smoothening. We get a factor dt, which is given by this integral of the distance with respect to the heat kernel. And then we have this energy or trace estimate that we just presented in terms of this dual Sobolev norm, which is expressed in this way. And this is more or less exactly as we had before in this simple Fourier analytic proof. Namely, we have two pieces, the dispersion, which is coming from the smoothening, and the other part, which is here much more complicated because it is involving the heat kernels and this dual Sobolev norm. But things are not so, not so difficult, actually, because on a compact manifold, the dis dispersion dt is at most of the order of t. And uh, it is well known that you have heat kernel bounds uh, on, uh, on compact manifolds, which are of this type, namely that the rate of your kernel on the diagonal is 1 over s to the d over 2, where d is the dimension. And you immediately see that when d is equal to 2, there will be something critical because it will be 1 over s. And this is exactly what happens, namely that if you try to do this optimization, you take the standard value t is 1 over n to the 2 over d when d is bigger than 3, but when d is equal to 2, you have to take the log, and you get log n over n. And with this, you get exactly the bounds that we had before, and the lesson is that everything is working as before on the, on the torus. But you can do it in general simply due to the fact that the heat kernel bounds reflect the, the, the rates in this Monge Kantorovich metric. You can do it for every P. Let me skip this. And let me come back to the Ambrosio Stratrevisan. Because, of course, this is only a proof of the upper bound. And in order to get the limit, you need to work much more. And this is what they did. And uh, they did it using the fact that for all Riemannian measure, you have a common heat kernel asymptotics, which is described by this limit. So you implement the same ideas as uh, just presented using the fact that you have this common heat kernel limit of the trace, which is given by this 4 pi, whatever, and you get the same uh, limit for all, all these cases in this optimal matching problem. So, but as announced, Dario Trevisan will present this in his lectures uh, next week. Let me mention that, uh, unfortunately, uh, it's a very nice result, but it's a bit frustrating because this limit is only known when p is equal to 2 and d is equal to 2. So it's very, nothing else is known so far on the limit of these quantities, besides the modified uh, subadditivity arguments which give limit, but uh, nobody knows uh, the values of those limits. So this limit is, is in dimension bigger than 1, starting with dimension 2. The only case is for p is equal to 2, and d is equal to 2. For example, p is equal to 2 and d is equal to 3, nothing. d is equal to 2, p is equal to 1, nothing is known. So let me just mention that the physicists they are really terrific because they have even much more precise conjectures. They want the second order in this, uh, in this limit, you see which is very amb ambitious, and uh, Ambrosio and Claudio were able to get something. And uh, they are even hoping for 
fluctuations. Recall that in dimension one, we will see this in a, in a second, uh, we had fluctuations around this chi-square, the integral of the square of the Brown and Bridge, and they are expecting to have the same here in dimension two, uh, towards a limit which is given by a kind of Gaussian, uh, L2 norm of a Gaussian free field. So as I said, this is just by comparison with the thing that we had in dimension one, this explicit distribution, and they are hoping to have the same in dimension two, but uh, research is very far from this conclusion at, the, at this point. So in the last part of this talk, I would like to just present some results on Gaussian samples. So what was presented before this PDE transportation approach using smoothening or regularization and this kind of energy estimate in terms of inverse Sobolev norm is actually quite robust and can be used for other distributions than distribution on compact manifold like the uniform distribution on, on the square or on the torus. And one good example is just the standard Gaussian distribution. So you are on RD, you have a Gaussian measure so this is a nice space, and you have a lot of technology in this setting. And in particular, in particular, you have uh, heat kernels and uh, integration by parts formula, so both spaces and Laplacian and, and so on. So this is a good thing uh, that we may also develop this approach for more general uh, samples than only uniform samples on compact manifold. So, standard Gaussian, what is the picture? First of all, let me recall the picture in dimension one that we saw before. We have this uh, threshold when P is equal to two. Things are getting very different. What happens in dimension two? But actually, as I said, you may use the PDE transportation approach and you get exactly the same inequality. DT is this dispersion factor and then you have the trace contribution, the energy contribution. But now the point is that you are no more using the heat kernel on a compact manifold, but you are using the kernels which are naturally associated to Gaussian measures. And this kernel is the Mailer kernel. So of course the formula here, you don't need to read it. The only thing that you have to know is that kernel is no more bounded. And this was of course a main issue in the study of the uh, AKT theorem, namely that the heat kernels were bounded with a rate of the order of S, 1 over S to the D over 2, where D is dimension, and this uniform bound was the key for the uh, rates in the AKT theorem. But here, this kernel is no more bounded, no more uniform bounds. So you have to do something else. If you do it directly, you won't get anything, because the trace is too big is not of the order of 1 over s to the d over 2, it is of the order of 1 over s to the d. So you cannot catch the correct orders. You only get a 1 over n to the 1 over n to the 1 over d, which is not good enough. And how can we get something? So we get something by a very simple idea, which is localization. What does it mean? You have your Gaussian measure, of course, it has infinite support. And the idea is that we should restrict it to something bounded, a big ball. There is a very easy coupling, which is described here, which indicates that you can actually do that on a ball of radius of the order of square root of log n. So the square root of log n is simply coming from the Gaussian tails. e to the minus x squared over 2. If you inverse this, you, get, you should expect uh, a ball to reduce on a ball of radius of the order of square root of log n. So this is a so-called localization uh, order. And uh, once you have this, you may repeat this PDE transportation uh, approach. Simply, in the trace formula, now you no more integrate over the full Gaussian measure, but you only integrate on the restriction on this ball. And if you do this, it's pretty nice because you get something which is of the order of 1 over s to the d over 2, which is the rate that we are expecting. 
but there is a price to pay, which is the size of the ball on which you do the localization. And if you put everything together, you get the following. Actually, this is for a Gaussian measure on RD, but we will see the three items, d is equal to one, two, and then d bigger than three. And what, what you see here is that this proof, first of all, it's good enough to recover dimension one. We have this log log. So that's a good indi indication that the proof is of interest. But when you look for d is equal to two and d bigger than three, you clearly feel that you get an extra factor log n due to the fact that you localized on a big ball of radius square root of log n. So there is an extra factor which is coming from the localization procedure, which is the log n. These are upper bounds. What can we say about lower bounds in the Gaussian case? There is a very simple trick and idea is that if you contract the Gaussian measure to the uniform, this is Lipschitz. This means that the rates for the Gaussian will always be bigger than the rates for the uniform. And you get lower bounds. So this is what is on the next slide. You contract the Gaussian measure on the unit tube. And this means that the rates for the uh, Gaussian are always bigger than the rates for the uniform. So this gives you lower bound. In particular, you have the AKT lower bound log n over n when p is equal to 2. So if you summarize what we have obtained, in the case d is equal to 2, we have the lower bound, which is log n over n, which is coming from this contraction argument and the uniform case. And on the uh, right-hand side, we have the log n squared, because we have an extra factor coming from this localization on a big ball of radius the square root of log n. So the question is, which one is the correct rate? And it is actually the squared, which is the correct rate, which is a big surprise. So this was obtained by, by Talagrand using some ideas about the generic chaining together with a scaling argument. Soon after, it was also obtained by the PDE method that I, that I described. The question of the limit is, is completely open. So when P is equal to D is equal to two, there is something special. Something special is happening. When P is the same as the dimension. Let me conclude with what is known for Gaussian samples for WP, summary of the conclusions which have been obtained so far using basically this PDE transportation approach. So this is what we have already seen two times, the comparison with the uniform in dimension one and the three uh, regimes for the Gaussian when P is in between one and two, for which it is the same as the uniform then you have this log log when p is equal to 2, and uh, something else when p is bigger than 2. What happens when d is equal to 2? So when t is equal to 2, we have the following picture. Again, in between 1 and 2, it's the same as the uniform. When p is equal to 2, which is a dimension, we have an extra log n. Something special is happening. And when p is bigger than 2, I don't know. No idea. And when D is bigger than three, we can show that up to D, this is a joint work with uh, J. Chang Zhu, uh, it is the same as the uniform. And when P is bigger than D, no idea. And what is expected is that something special should happen when P is equal to D. So for example, study W3 in R3. So, thank you. <laughs>